This Earth of ours is about five billion years old. Life has existed on it for about three billion years. But just 25 years ago, the world was astounded by an incredible event. This tiny capsule took man beyond the Earth's gravity, and ever since, courageous people, one after another, have been going out into space. Each one remembers his childhood on Earth, but in their new space life, for all of them, home is Stellar Town. My home, Stellar Town. Many cosmonauts did filming in space. First there was delight, and humanity applauded the first man to see the Earth from space. We listened to him as we would listen to a poet. Then we ourselves saw how beautiful our planet was. We saw through the eyes of those lucky people, the cosmonauts. There was a time when cosmonauts tried to convince us that theirs was very ordinary work up in orbit. But they saw more than just a meadow and a street. They saw the entire planet. Little by little we started forming an entirely different picture of their work. Not so exotic, very tense and demanding, at times dangerous, requiring strength, brains and knowledge. Their path to the stars started here in Zvezdny, or Stellar Town, at the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center opened 25 years ago. From Gagarin's historical flight, lasting but 108 minutes, to eight months working in space, such is the distance covered by cosmonauts from Stellar Town. What was the beginning like for those who were first? The road was laid by students and teachers together, for no one then knew what awaited them up in orbit. They were all excellent jet pilots and were quite at home in supersonic conditions. They were cool, brave and intelligent. The best and most experienced were chosen, the healthiest and the smallest. For in those days, every gram was counted. The smaller the man, the more apparatus could be installed. At the source of these events was a man whose name was known to but a very few. We can only regret that there are so few film clips of him from those days. He sent a man into the unknown for the sake of a dream, for the glory of his country. Yuri Gagarin, he had a mother, a wife, and children. Dear friends, my dear ones, and those whom I don't know, my countrymen, people of all lands and continents, in a few minutes a mighty spaceship will take me up into the distant space of the universe. What can I say to you in these few minutes before the start? My entire life seems to me to have been a wonderful moment, and all that I have experienced and accomplished earlier was experienced and accomplished for just this minute. Courageous and strong as he was, he was still but an ordinary human being of flesh and blood. He was kind-hearted and had the astonishing ability of always and everywhere being himself. And that is how the world remembers him. He was called the Columbus of the universe, son of the earth, but he remained his parent's son.
All that was 25 years ago. Since then, Stellar Town has grown immensely, together with the now large family of cosmonauts. There have been tragic losses for mothers and for us. Gagarin and Karolyov are no more. Twenty-five years. How many times they came to this office in the Kremlin where Lenin worked, when no one had yet heard of them. But a day or two later their photographs would appear in all the newspapers. Valentina was chanted for the first woman cosmonaut, and the world started learning to pronounce Russian names. This is Stellar Town today. It resembles just about any other young town in the Soviet Union, and at times it is difficult to imagine that about 60 crews were trained and fitted out here for their work in space. And each consecutive crew was faced with ever more difficult work. Cosmonaut Vladimir Shatalov. The great Russian scientist Konstantin Tsiolkovsky believed that the development of outer space would bring humanity mountains of grain and boundless might. And now, developing space with the help of manned space systems, we better understand what Tsiolkovsky had in mind. The mountains of grain are, of course, not only wheat, but also science, a better understanding of the Earth, of the atmosphere, of space. It also means the crystals we are learning to grow in space. It is also materials without which the further progress of industry is impossible, and the new energy which we hope sometime to generate in space and bring to man on Earth. In test tubes and in small smelting furnaces, new technology is being perfected, and a new trend, space materiology, is being born. This work requires special knowledge and close harmony with Earth science. Scores of academic and associated institutes today not only help to process materials produced in space, but also help prepare the cosmonauts. Today's cosmonauts must be acquainted with physics, biology, meteorology, chemistry, and medicine. That is why medical and biological research remains an important part of cosmonaut training. Today's stellar town can be looked upon as a constellation of institutes. For example, a branch of the photography department of the Cinematography Institute trains cosmonauts to film not only the surface of the Earth or carry out onboard experiments, but also to film anything unique they may observe in space. Or this institute, something with no equal on Earth. This is the inside of a Soyuz space vessel. As one young skeptic remarked, I've seen more complicated control panels on Earth. That may be so. However, top-class equipment must leave humans a minimum of control. The precision of their decisions here must be in direct proportion to the speed of the spaceship in relation to the speed of jet airliners. And that is why the training stand must simulate real space conditions as closely as possible. Maximum simulation in everything. 
This is one of the spacesuits worn by cosmonauts working in raw space for 40 hours from the Salut 7 spaceship in the last three years. And more work is in sight. That is why this special complex was erected here with a model of the orbital station. Of course, training for the first cosmonauts was not simple either. But with the more sophisticated equipment appearing, the work becomes more complicated. The day will come when it will be time to erect whole settlements in space, fantastic as this may sound today, and assemble solar power stations and factories. These are spacemen of the 80s, possibly even the 90s. In this special pool, in hydro weightlessness, they perfect their movements for working in raw space, the work of tomorrow. As the years go by, fantasy becomes reality. And Stellar Town must be a step ahead of fantasy. The success of future work in space is ensured here. And the better the preparations and training on Earth, the better the results of every minute in space. Extreme conditions on Earth disclose existing and reserve possibilities of the human organism, help the cosmonaut preserve his strength and efficiency in space, especially in unexpected situations. Simulators, hydro laboratories, and huge centrifuges, the training center today has everything necessary to simulate space conditions on Earth from blast off to landing. However, this is not only a training center, it is also a research complex and thus the interest shown in it by the Academy of Sciences. Only after seeing it does one understand the entire complexity of cosmonaut training, says Dr. Alexandrov. This is truly precision work, which allows the cosmonauts to take part in such long-term flights and maintain their efficiency. As for the significance of space flights, I believe we are just beginning to develop it for our national economy. However, in the field of cartography and forestry, for example, I think there have already been some excellent results. In cartography, this is undoubtedly so. In geology, there have also been important results. It was difficult to forecast this. I think this allows us to economize large funds in geological prospecting. In these 25 years of space developments, we have added greatly to our knowledge of space physics, oceanology, meteorology, agriculture, metallurgy, and welding. Cosmic information is now indispensable for the development of many branches of science and the national economy.
on the 25th anniversary of the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. A big meeting was held at the Space Pavilion of the National Economic Achievements Exhibition in Moscow, where the center was awarded the exhibition's gold medal. Among the other awards it has received, this gold medal is recognition of the center's contribution to the national economy. But what about the center's international achievements? It has done a good deal in preparing and carrying out the joint Soviet-U.S. Soyuz Apollo space mission. Then, in the early 70s, this was looked upon as a flight of hope. When I opened the hatch of the Apollo to say hello to my Soviet colleague, Alexei Leonov, I believed that a new era had begun in man's history, said Tom Stafford. We all dreamed of that then, and it is not our fault that so far this dream has not materialized. We have always been for peaceful cooperation in space, and the most apparent and simplest confirmation of this are the 11 international flight crews that were trained at the space center. 11 international space expeditions that did so much for their countries, their science, and for broadening our common experience and knowledge, as well as for friendship and understanding and the peaceful use of space. Stellar Towns International Mission also reflects the general principles guiding our country in developing cooperation. We generously share our experience with other countries, invite them to participate and to join forces in interesting space research work. And Soviet cosmonauts have a wealth of experience to share with others. For example, the experience of Svetlana Savitska, the world's second woman cosmonaut, who twice worked in raw space. Or Leonid Kizim, whose crew spent eight months, 237 days in space, so far the world record. Soviet cosmonauts recall those first young men with so little experience. Today, many of our cosmonauts are highly skilled specialists, doctors, professors, and candidates of science. Many help design space vessels, guide flights, and teach aspiring cosmonauts. In these 25 years, there were times when the most sophisticated equipment was helpless, and only man with his brains, skill and courage could find a solution to a critical situation. For example, in the spring of 1985, when the Salute 7 station was operating in automatic mode, mission control suddenly became alarmed.
Salute 7 was not responding to commands from Earth. Radio communications had broken off. Telemetric information was not being received. There was no information on the whereabouts of the station and its orientation. There could be no question of automatic search and docking with Salute 7. A special group of experienced cosmonauts was needed to save the station. June 6th. This is part of a direct TV transmission showing this unique operation. Vladimir Janibekov and Viktor Savinik are on radio contact with mission control. The expedition was of course thoroughly prepared, and not only through special training at Stellar Town, a whole new complex of orientation and maneuvering instruments had been installed on board the spaceship. Earth was waiting with bated breath. It could only observe, hear, and consult, but it could do no more. This was Jenny Bekov's fifth space mission. A few years ago, he had already manipulated a manual docking maneuver with Salute 7, but that could not be compared with the present situation. Viktor Savinik is one of the designers of Salute 7, and he was training for a lengthy expedition. Here, however, he had to help save the station. The station was ominously silent and cold. Later, Johnny Bekov wrote, most important was not to lose one's nerve and faith in yourself. On the second day, they successfully connected the onboard chemical battery with the solar battery. This was accomplished at night. They were economizing air and water. They had to feel through hundreds of cables, connections, joints and instruments to check them and replace where necessary. Real warmth arrived only after they carried out an extremely difficult exit into raw space to attach extra solar panels. Only then did the station resume functioning. Later, Vasutin and Volkov arrived on Salute 7 together with Georgi Grechko for a week of scientific work. Viktor Savinik remained on board while Commander Janibekov and Georgi Grechko returned to Earth. All of Stellar Town came out to greet them. Everyone knew it would be difficult, but no one really imagined just how difficult the mission would turn out to be. 
To greet their commander and colleague in joint missions, Gurak Cha came from Mongolia and Chrétien from France. A good deal was said about heroism, skill, and dedication on that day. Johnny Bekov, however, was reticent. We just did what we had to do, he said. That same summer of 1985, the 12th World Youth and Student Festival was opened in Moscow by Gagarin's daughter, Galya. This was not only accepted as symbolical of a relay of generations, but also as a tribute to the memory of a man who has remained perpetually young and beloved the world over, a kind and understandable person to all peace advocates. And today's cosmonauts continue what Yuri Gagarin started. I would love to take part in a space flight with a crew made up of cosmonauts of different nationalities, Gagarin once said. Well, humanity has everything needed for that. We Earth people possess all that is required for the broad international development of space. All we need for that is peace, concord and agreement. Script and directions in Yakin, camera Yormalayev and Lovkov. <laughs> 